Okay, I'm probably going to have to walk around a bit. So, um, my presentation is about my independent study topic, which is atmospheric harvesting of hydrogen and helium for nuclear fusion fuel. Wait for it. Okay, timing is off a little bit. <laughs> um, from giant planets. Uh, this is a portion of my research. I didn't have time to fit everything into here, so the, this is the gist of it, basically. <clears throat> um, so as we've been discussing, um, the three most commonly considered fuels for nuclear fusion are deuterium, tritium, and helium-3. Uh, deuterium is basically hydrogen with an extra neutron, so a proton, neutron, and electron. It's um, pretty simple. It's fairly uncommon, but there are are ways to take extract, extract it from seawater right now, which is the most common way of acquiring it. So this stuff you can get pretty easily. Uh, tritium is made as a result of, or it was produced for use in nuclear weapons, and so getting a hold of that is kind of tricky. It's also radioactive, which is not good for a lot of things. Um, so that's a little harder to use as an actual feasible fuel. And the other one is helium-3 which is a rare isotope of helium, which has one sh is one sh short one neutron of helium-4, the typical form of helium. Um, this is found on the Earth's moon in very small amounts from a deposition from the solar wind, but otherwise it occurs very rarely in uh, uh, natural helium supplies. Um, you can see on the left side too, the, or right side, the uh, equations for nuclear fusion using these compound or elements. And one thing to note is that in both the deuterium and tritium reaction, the deuterium and deuterium reaction, um, the products pr include neutrons, which will be, uh, can be ionizing and damaging to uh, reactor structures and also just injurious to human health as well. Whereas the deuterium helium three reaction produces protons instead of neutrons, which is less hazardous. And so um, helium and deuterium reactions are considered to be safer in that they don't irradiate their surroundings as much. So another be benefit to using that reaction. <clears throat> so where do we get this stuff? Um, as I mentioned, helium-3 is on the moon and deuterium is fairly common, but in order to get large quantities of these gas gases or elements, um, we need a steady supply of gases. And for that, the gas, the giant planets are comprised almost in, of, of an ex effectively unlimited supply of helium and hydrogen. And that includes deuterium, which has a, again, a natural abundance of um, a small amount of, of hydrogen that exists in the solar system, but a still measurable amount. It's something like about one gram of deuterium per kilogram or per liter of seawater. I might be rough on that, but it's, it's about that much. Uh, and helium-3, again, it's un uncommon, but considering the quantities that are available in the gas giants, this is um, more so than we have on Earth, at least. Um, in addition to these fusion fuels in the gas giants, there's also hydrogen, the typical form, that is useful as a propellant, especially in nuclear uh, thermal propulsion where it has a very low mass and thus can produce a very high specific impulse. So you can get a lot of propulsion out of a smaller amount of propellant. And there's also methane, which is used in uh, some modern and historical rockets when mixed with oxygen. It's a good combustion reaction for liquid propulsion and just for uh, combustive power generation as well. So there are some useful gases that can be found in these giant planets. We just have to acquire them somehow. And with that, there are several, uh, so there hasn't been a whole lot of research on actually doing this before. Um, the, most of it comes from Brian Pelizewski from NASA. And um, this is some of, a lot of what is presented here is things that he's proposed and I've kind of expanded upon a little bit. Um, so the primary element of this process is an aerospace craft, which I have an example on the side there. Um, which is essentially a vehicle that can fly from orbit into the atmosphere of the gas giant, giant planet, and collect gases in some way or another, and return back into orbit with those gases in its cargo. Um, the, a secondary 
addendum to this process is using aerostat balloons that are hovering within the atmosphere of the planet. And they're collecting gases on, uh, into their internal storage. And an, the aerospacecraft would fly down, dock with these balloons, and collect the gases that they have been harvesting from the atmosphere. And then it would continue back into orbit. <clears throat> That's sort of the essential element, the, the most essential elements of these processes so, that have been proposed so far. Uh, in addition to that, we need a couple other elements that would be this orbital transfer vehicle, an example shown here, um, which is once the aerospacecraft returns to orbit, it then hands off its propellant to this OTV, and this vehicle will then transfer it to wherever it needs to go for storage. Um, in most, think, uh, in most propo proposals, this storage is at one of the moons of the giant planets. Um, then another element that I've kind of added as part of my research was a mothership, which is something to carry all of these individual spacecraft from Earth. Um, this would basically simplify the deployment process of the entire operation, as well as being a mobile or semi-mobile uh, location which can store these collected gases in orbit around a moon. There's a lot of moving parts here, but I'll have a, have a graph later that should hopefully explain how everything fits together here. So we have a general idea of how this sort of thing could work, um, but now we have four different planets to choose from as far as where we're going to do this. So with that, I have done some research onto which planets are optimal and very much not optimal. Um, so starting from distance from the sun, oh, I think this stopped working. There we go. Jupiter. <clears throat> Uh, this was actually my first pick before I started researching anymore, just because it is closest to the sun. Uh, that is not a good enough reason, however, because Jupiter has very intense radiation belts um, due to its massive magnetic field. And this produces, uh, the, the radiation produced here is intense enough to even damage, uh, potentially damage some of the spacecraft that have flown there already. They had to, there was concern that they would actually not work because of these radiation fields. Um, so, that makes it very difficult to actually have any sort of human presence within this vicinity of the planet, at least for any extended period of time. Uh, it, however, the Galilean moons, uh, the four big ones, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, are, have a lot of valuable resources on them, and people have talked about uh, Europa potentially even being a location where there's life. So there is a lot of other, or these moons are potentially valuable scientific locations even though they are mostly within the radiation belts. Um, the wind speeds of Jupiter are also very high, but compared to some of the other planets, we'll see this is actually not that bad. Um, and for atmospheric composition, you can see um, these numbers that I have on here are relative to the hydrogen of the planet, since it doesn't really make sense to calculate how much hydrogen and helium is in Jupiter. It's just a percentage of, if you were to sample the atmosphere, this would be the proportions of the gases you would find. So there's about 15% helium versus the how much of the, versus hydrogen. <clears throat> um, and then, so as regarding selecting a moon of Jupiter or of any planet to send these gases to once they're collected, uh, this is uh, some data produced by Brian Palazuski, uh, who I mentioned has done most of this work previously. Um, so these are delta V values, or change in velocity, required to go from the atmosphere of Jupiter to orbit around these planets, or these moons. Um, so they are also calculated on the high thrust for a chemical propulsion system with the high, about approximately the highest possible uh, best performance you could get from liquid propulsion. And then also a nuclear thermal propulsion engine, which is a higher specific impulse but lower thrust. Um, so, and as you can see for reference, the delta V from Earth to the moon is about nine kilometers per second. And compared to that, all of these moons are very, have very high requirements for actually completing a mission like this. So not that it's impossible, it's just that it's going to require much bigger engine system and bigger rockets basically in order to uh, pull this off. Uh, another quick note is that of all these moons, Callisto is the only one that has any really feasible application as a site for humans to work on because these other the other three are irradiated in way too much. Uh, Callisto still gets radiation as well, but it's 
manageable, essentially. This is not Callisto, this is Europa, but I just wanted to mention that. <clears throat> All right, moving on then to Saturn. Uh, Saturn also has intense radiation, which is bad, but it's also uh, in, within a smaller vicinity of the planet, so up to about Tethys or um, partway through the rings, essentially. So moons like Titan, which is another very valuable scientific location for research, uh, would be more feasible uh, as a storage location. Titan also has a methane atmosphere, so that could also be useful for collection there as well. <clears throat> um, Wind speeds go up to 450 meters per second, or 1,000 miles per hour, which is um, even more difficult to work with than Jupiter, <laughs> uh, to say the least. Uh, as far as atmospheric composition, there's actually some discrepancy in how much helium Saturn contains. Um, this lower number, I believe, is based on experimental results from space probes that have visited it primarily, but the higher number is based on, I think, um, mathematical modeling using that data, uh, it's, there, there's not really, a, I, don't, I don't think there's a consensus on which one is more accurate, but I think the higher value can, corresponds better to mathematical modeling incorporating observational data. Uh, I couldn't find any conclusive answer on that though, so just keeping in mind that there is some uh, discrepancy as far as what you would actually find on Saturn. <clears throat> Um, as far as moons go, these delta V values are much more manageable than Jupiter in most cases, but they are still quite high compared to our Earth to Moon baseline. So um, using chemical propulsion at least, it's a bit more manageable, um, but these are still a little above our feasibility area. Um, and as I mentioned too, Titan is having a methane atmosphere and also a potential location for life would be a nice scientific research location it just might be a little difficult to use for this sort of operation. <clears throat> All right, so moving a little further out, we have Uranus, which has uh, a much more mild radiation environment. It's very close to that of Earth, actually. And so this is the first planet we've seen that would actually be somewhat feasible for humans to actually be operating within this planetary system. Uh, there are the five major moons, as well as some inner moons that are closer in the vicinity of the rings. Uh, they're all icy. They have uh, ices on the surface that could be useful for other resources. Um, they kind of, um, at, at this point too, we're getting to the point where there hasn't been as much observational or observations performed on these planets. So we're working with more limited data. Uh, the wind speeds are actually the lowest that we've seen so far by a little bit. Compared to Jupiter, it's a little slower. 390 miles per hour is still very fast, but it's at least not so bad compared to the 1,000 miles per hour on Saturn. Um, again, I'm working in American units, but hopefully you can understand. <laughs> um, and so uh, regarding the atmosphere, this data is for the troposphere of the planet, which is based on um, more direct observations I think it was Voyager, but I need to double check that. Um, so this isn't necessarily for the whole planet, but this is the area at which we would actually be operating anyway, is the uh, point of the atmosphere where it actually is thick enough to be collecting gases from. And you can see from that that there is, again, a good amount of helium in here, as well as a, a elevated amounts of methane. So this might be a downside if we only are caring about helium, but if we want methane as well, then we get a little bonus from this as well. I think this battery is dying. I'll tell. Sorry. I think you have to oh. point it somewhere else. Oh, oh I got it. <laughs> um, so uh, for the moons, like I mentioned, there's five potential oppor uh, opportune moons here. And comparing against our baseline, most of them are, with, at least with chemical rockets, are with, have lower delta V requirements than Earth's moon from the surface of Earth. So here we actually see an improvement over our current technology, over what is uh, actually capable as far as delta V requirements. So um, as far as rocket propulsion goes, this is much more doable than Saturn or Jupiter. <clears throat> All right, and finally, Neptune. Again, this has a much more mild radiation environment, so possible or at least feasible for humans to be operating in this area. Um, Triton is an, another moon that has gained some interest as far as scientific research goes. 
Uh, there are also a lot of smaller moons within the area of the uh, vicinity of the rings that could be useful for uh, orbital maneuvers. Same with um, Saturn and Uranus as well. I forgot to mention that. Um, however, it also has the highest measured wind speeds in the solar system, or at least of the giant planets, up to 1,300 miles per hour or 600 meters per second. So if we're going to be worrying about wind speeds, this would be the worst case scenario. Um, again, we're going off of the tropospheric composition here instead of the overall planetary values because that's the data that was um, most uh, reliable that I could find. Um, but again, you see we have a good amount of helium, uh, methane as well, and actually water is also a fairly common, uh, somewhat common component as well. So uh, we get some bonus gases with our helium collection if that were the case. And as far as moons go, um, most of them, again, are within this, or less than this 9 kilometers per second baseline. So uh, making them much more accessible using modern scale technology of rocket propulsion. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, this is Triton. I was going to say something else about that, but yeah. So a um, lot of data to consider here. This is kind of just everything all at once. Um, but going over what we've seen so far, what I've presented here, uh, Saturn and Jupiter are looking like pretty difficult targets for these sort of operations, especially just with the radiation. Uh, Saturn as well with comes to uh, wind speeds, not too conducive to flight. Um, and then the moons of Jupiter and somewhat Saturn as well, they're just such big planets. There's so much gravity. It's just not really feasible as far as modern uh, rocket propulsion, or at least historically. With Uranus and Neptune, though, that's much more uh, feasible as far as what it actually would take as far as delta V and um, as far as wind speeds go. Uranus, uh, it's much more manageable compared to the other alternatives. And um, with again, with Uranus and Neptune, we also get methane in the mix as well. So there's a bonus results as well. Um, so taking that into consideration, um, for the purposes of this research, I've picked Uranus and Miranda as the target uh, location for a atmospheric mining operation. And as a close second, Neptune and its inner moons could probably work as well if we were able to manage that um, extremely fast winds, which could be possible in the future. There's more further research required, essentially. Okay, so this is very briefly the process for a mission like this. Um, I know I've talked about a, lo a lot about this at the beginning, and it is fairly com complicated, but uh, I'll try to explain it in a somewhat cohesive manner here. Um, I think I can point to everything. So we start starting from Earth orbit, the mothership carrying all of our vessels and spacecraft deploys to Uranus over how, whichever sort of orbital transfer we need to get there in a reason, reasonable amount of time. Once it arrives, it then deploys its infrastructure or its spacecraft into their orbits, um, including support satellites for monitoring weather conditions and communications relays. Um, so once they're deployed, the aero oh yeah, and also it will then launch the aerostats into the balloons into the orb uh, the atmosphere of Uranus, and where they can start collecting the gases in the atmosphere. Once they are full, or some, however many in a group of aerostats are ready, the aerospacecraft will dive into the atmosphere and then collect the gas from each aer uh, aerostat that's ready to be harvested. Um, once that's complete, it will return back into Uranus orbit, where the OTV, orbital transfer vehicle, will dock with it, receive the gases from the aerospacecraft. Um, and then it will travel, it, uh, okay, let's back up a second. Once the mothership has finished deploying everything, it will then move to orbit around Miranda, where it will be act as a storage facility, where all the gases will eventually be stored uh, in the meantime. Um, it will, so once the orbital space, I'm going to skip a step and I'm going to come back to this. Once the orbital transfer vehicle reaches Miranda orbit, it transfers its helium and other valuable gases to the mothership for storage. So we have, we've brought our gases from the planet into orbit around the moon. Um, once we're there, we have another vehicle from Earth come to pick up the gases in or from the mothership or the storage location. 
Um, this doesn't really happen. It have to happen at any certain time. It's just uh, a separate operation. And then once it's collected those gases, it can then return and deliver them to wherever they are needed for fusion propulsion or power generation. Um, back at the mothership, once the orbital transfer vehicle is complete, it will, actually, I'm going to back up even further a little bit. So once the mothership is in orbit around Miranda, it then also deploys a surface operation to the surface of the moon to collect ices, which include uh, oxygen or, or water ices and oxygen, which includes oxygen. <laughs> so um, once that ice has been, uh, the oxygen from that ice has been extracted, it is then sent up on a lunar lander to the mothership. So the mothership is now storing oxygen as well as its helium or the atmospheric mixture. When the orbital transfer vehicle arrives, some of that oxygen is delivered to the orbital transfer vehicle, and that oxygen is then brought back to the aerospacecraft. And then in combination with some of the collected atmospheric mixture, which includes hydrogen, the hydrogen and oxygen are burned together in chemical propulsion to give it an extra propulsive, uh, extra thrust, so that it's able to actually continually go up and down out of the atmosphere of this of the planet. Um, and this process is repeated as many times as necessary, or you can double up as many times as uh, reasonable to uh, multiply the results of this collection operations. Um, it's a big investment, I'm sure, so it might not be uh, something that might actually get done right away. But in, pr in principle, this, is a, this sort of thing could be duplicated or replicated in multiple places on the planet, depending on weather conditions or, and how much helium and uh, gaseous results we are actually looking to get. And with that, I have seven pages of references, and I could not fit them all in one slide, so I just decided to put it in a two minute long video. Um, and with that, I'm open to questions if you have any. Very good, very good. Questions? Yes. I really, uh, wonderful, uh, yeah, wonderful presentation. I want to ask you, you mentioned about the uh, fusion reaction between deuterium and helium, right? Uh, yeah. In the second slide, I believe. Yes. So, uh, is it like the uh, neutronic fusion? Uh, is it related to that? Yes, the helium and deuterium reaction is an aneutronic reaction, whereas there's no neutrons produced from it, just protons. So that's where you don't have to worry about neutron radiation that can um, damage or irradiate or activate uh, reactor materials. So, safer overall. Right. So, have there been any work going on, like any projects? Do you know? I. With this. I, th I'm not sure. Uh, I believe Princeton might have done it in their Princeton physics lab. There's another P in there, um, but I think uh, the rarity of helium makes it uncommon. Um, I'm not sure how often it's been done so far. Right. And also, uh, one last question. Uh, what do you propose the mission life will be of uh, the mothership? Like? Ah, yes. So, um, in Palazuski's calculations, he had, is a lot, he has done a lot more on the, like, the mass requirements and the transit times, uh, how long each of these systems are going to be in use. It's on the order, at least um, not so much on the in and out of the atmosphere side, but on the transit and storage. This is on the order of decades or years at least. Now, the, down, uh, the caveat to that is if there was f nuclear fusion propulsion available for this sort of system, then we're able to massively reduce the transfer times between Earth and the planet or anywhere else in the solar system, really. So this is all done... Uh, under the assumption that we don't have fusion propulsion available, but if it was, then a lot of these steps could be sped up pretty significantly. Um, and in the terms of the mothership, we, it would even be possible to just replace it or even bring another storage vehicle as necessary if we could get it there in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. And I love the last slide with all the culmination of everything. So that was very informative and kind of gave us a good clarity on 
what you were thinking. But <clears throat> mine is not technical. It's just me trying to um, understand your opinion in regards to this is you said we are after harvesting it we will send potentially another ship or something from earth to kind of pick it up bring it back or use it for somewhere else yes so with the current technologies because you were also mentioning that the mothership may have fusion or not but for now considering that it doesn't have fusion mm -hmm. and with the current technology propulsive technologies is it really worth it in your opinion again uh, i'm not questioning the project is it really worth it to kind of travel all the way pick up the gases and bring it back as far as uh like economics or like what do you mean worth it so like so there are two two things to look at right one is time because mm -hmm. with the current technology that we have to travel that distance is probably going to take years. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so, the there are two um, opposing options we have here. The one would be to just get all of our helium three from the moon, and if that is effective enough, if we can get enough helium three from the surface of the moon to power fusion on Earth, that's probably going to be faster and easier than this whole shenanigans. But um, if that is an ineffective process or like we get a very small amount of it versus maybe once every 10 years we get a lifetime supply of helium-3 or and again I'm not, uh, I'm not as familiar with the actual quantities of mass required for fusion operations but they release a ton of energy just from individual particles. So if we get like say 10 years of worth of fuel every 10 years, that could balance out in that regard. The other option is if we have fusion operations that are in the outer solar system, like power generation for um, extraterrestrial settlements, then it might make more sense just to send the helium-3 there instead of having to bring it all the way back to Earth. We could use it out there while it's there kind of thing. That's where I think I was kind of trying to get it because if all of this works out, the mothership, instead of returning back, can potentially escape the solar system and go outwards. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you, Susmita. Yeah, I think this is a project of projects. I mean, like, uh, there are m many questions which, but it can be individual projects like dropping the aerostats and taking that on board again and picking, but I think it's, it's very interesting. The alternative to that is if, because I think the project would work if there is fusion. That's the first uh, assumption. Mm -hmm. It could be done. It could be used as an um, intermediate step to go somewhere else. I mean, we don't have to bring back the, <clears throat> the fuel to yes. the Earth. One of the earlier re uh, references I found to this project, this sort of this concept, was in using this process to collect fuel for an interstellar mission. Yes. Uh, Daedalus project yes. was the thing. So, yeah, it definitely uh, would be a valuable tool for that. Uh, and, and two, like, I, this is, again, yeah, it is a very big project. So I, my research is basically on what is it going to take to make this sort of thing feasible. Uh, I did not figure out every step of the way, but I tried to point out uh, in the extended document uh, that all those references are for, I tried to figure out what parts need to be developed further and actually... Like, what do we need to learn between now and then to actually make this happen? Yeah. There are like six different sub projects we can do. Yeah, <laughs> right? at least, yeah. With this one slide. Yeah. Yep. So, if anyone's looking for a PhD topic, is. We're not even with that, will be several of them. But oh, yeah. It's very interesting. As a, yes. as a, I, I like it very much. In fact, f f fusion. I think we could cross the whole uh, solar system in one year, which means from the Earth to Neptune will be between 100 and 200 days, maybe. Yeah, so like if, if we get one load back to Earth of helium-3 to power our fusion engines, everything speeds up from there, yep. assuming we have that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Bailey. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. And if you'd like to watch all two minutes of this, you can. But, uh, <laughs> Star Wars. Yeah, How did you do Wars this? Soundtrack. I, I rendered it in Blender because it was oh taking it was God. taking too long to do it in PowerPoint. So this is cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Well, thank you very much, Bailey. Hey everyone, a quick addendum here. Uh, firstly, thank you all very much for watching. 
Uh, as I mentioned, this is not the entirety of my research on this project. There is a bit more that I just didn't have time for in this presentation. And I am hoping to publish my research on this in research paper form into a journal in the near future. So once that is published, I will update the description of this video with a link to the paper. Uh, so this was an extemporaneous presentation, so it's quite possible I missed something or misspoke. So uh, if you have any questions or just want clarification on something or want to correct me on something I misspoke or said wrong or presented incorrectly, uh, feel free to please leave a comment and uh, be happy to see uh, your thoughts on this subject as well. I'm also hoping to make a couple more projects based on this concept. I didn't render that space station just for a six second intro. so. Um, I have a few more things I want to do with this. I'm not sure when or if that'll happen, but it'll probably be a while in any case, just because of the, the scale of the project. But in any case, uh, thank you very much for watching. If you like the video, click the like button to let me know and to help boost it in YouTube algorithm and such. Uh, if you'd like to see more of what I'm working on here, in addition to just my research, uh, you can consider subscribing. I have a, quite a variety of other projects on this channel, if any of that interests you. And with all that said, uh, thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it, and I hope you have a great day.